What is the importance of empirical methodologies to economic thinking? It is critical for um, for economic analysis to have to have models that are both kind of conceptually and theoretically coherent, but also empirically grounded. And in order to understand the success of uh, uh, models empirically, it takes formal methods and. Um, <coughs> Lots of people kind of just plot data and do eyeballs on them and do what I think of as the eyeball metric, and, it's, it, and there's lots of cases where that can be misleading and the like. So kind of formal approaches to thinking about empirical evidence and what it has to say about alternative economic models I think is critical for the field advancing. The empirical methods you developed were cited by the Nobel Committee for the empirical analysis of asset prices. But I understand your empirical methods have been applied in other areas of economics. Which areas, and what do you think have been important contributions from these other applications? Uh, my my main interests have been not in just asset prices alone, but in but in linkages between asset pricing and the macroeconomy. So. Um, when you look at asset prices, what, it, what does that tell us about the macroeconomy? When, when, when you look at what's going on in the macroeconomy, how do you expect that to be reflected in asset prices? So it's those, those type of linkages have been of critical interest to me. Um, just my empirical methods, so that's, uh, uh, that's, that's a rather interesting question there. Um, let me start by saying what, what I view as the mission of methods like, like the type that you refer to. Um, <coughs> Perhaps put a bit too simply, uh, the aim is to do something without having to do everything. So let me elaborate first in the context of the, link, the macro finance linkages. So one could imagine that to study those linkages, you have to have a full-blown model of the macro economy, you have to have a full-blown model of the financial sector, and you have to have the two things um, uh, um, completely integrated. Um, the aim of methods like 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 I've been working on, and I'm kind of building on a longer tradition within within econometrics, is to try to do something without doing everything. How can I study that linkage without having that full specification of the macroeconomy, without having the full spe specification of the financial sector, in aims of getting some robustness to the analysis without having to do having a full understanding of everything. So I I kind of view this notion of doing something without doing everything as as a, as, as an important empirical endeavor and and the econometric methods that that I was uh, that I was working on and I, as I say I'm building on a on, on a tradition within a, um, econometrics kind of has um, um, has that in mind in terms of the specific contributions I uh, I'm influenced uh, I'm influenced in part by a very nice book written by Manuel Ariano a friend of mine who's uh, who's a distinguished scholar in Sempi in Madrid on on panel data analysis and that kind of gives a, a nice <laughs> A nice um, uh, discussion of how methods, how these similar type of methods are very useful in the analysis of panel data. So, what's panel data? Uh, a lot of my research does time series analysis, and so time series looks at uh, uh, time series of financial markets and the macro economy and the like. Panel data looks at individuals over time. Now, the same type of models we build for the macro economy are often are, are grounded in microeconomic underpinnings. So, so the same type of methods that tend to, that are that are useful for one problem are also useful in in the other problem. Individuals they make portfolio decisions, they make savings decisions, they um, uh, and the like. And so that's that that I think has meant meant that the methods that I that I was working on have had this more general applicability. What is the importance of incorporating the finance sector into current day macroeconomic models? And what implications, if any, did the lack of connection between financial and macro modeling have for the run-up to the recent financial crisis and policymakers' ability to understand and respond to the crisis? So this is a question I could probably spend hours talking about, but let me try to condense it a little bit. Um, a lot of pre-crisis, a lot of uh, model, a lot of macroeconomic models had a very passive financial sector to them. And many macroeconomists made arguments that um, for a lot of purposes, we can think of finance and macroeconomics as kind of s separate endeavors, and that we don't really need to understand how financial mo markets work and to get to, to under to, to for the macroeconomy and kind of con and people in finance were kind of conversely were making very similar statements. What I believe that we you know the the uh, recent financial crisis was. Um, 
exposed gaps in our knowledge, in my view. It showed shortcomings in our understandings, and it, and, and it showed some uh, f um, flaws in some of our modeling. And those flaws, I think, precisely have to do with this kind of connection between the financial sector and the macroeconomy. It, it seemed like it's, it was a, um, a bigger deal, um, and, and that we really th that there's much more for us to learn there. So, uh, so you know, lots of people didn't expect in the kind of modern U.S. economy that a financial market disruption would play out in the macroeconomy in such a big and prominent way, and that did, and it caught and that caught people people by surprise. So I. If you, so so I view that that is a really important modeling challenge going forward. How do we really, really improve that connection um, in, in models that have quantitative and empirical ambitions? Now, why is this relevant for policymaking? Well, so because of bills like the Dodd Frank Act and and kind of European counterparts to those laws, um, the government policymakers are now charged with uh, a much more ambitious role in uh, in in, uh, in overseeing financial markets when it comes to their impact on the macroeconomy. There's this macro prudential policy is, is, has become a, a, uh, a new policy making challenge. Um, so this is like a new challenge that's, that some people think is kind of very analogous to what goes on in monetary policy. So we spent a lot of time as economics profession and as policymakers figuring out what you know, good and sensible rules were for the conduct of monetary policy. So now we're being asked to do something similar potentially for uh, for how to monitor the financial sector and trying to um, and and trying to devise courses of actions going forward. <clears throat> if you go and you look at key key people in policy making positions um, uh, in the various feds at the Bank of England and the like the first thing that they will acknowledge is the fact that there's some concepts like systemic risk that we just don't have a good understanding of. And, they, and they've been charged with a regulatory mandate to monitor that, and we, and, and, but yet we don't have great um, trustworthy models that allow us to do precisely that. So I, I think long term it's critical that we understand better these, uh, these linkages between financial markets and the macroeconomy. And there's, of course, policymakers have to also engage in actions now. So I've been in many policymaking, um, many events with policymakers in which you'll hear statements like, well, uh, because of this financial crisis, we have a really complicated problem ahead of us in terms of the linkages between financial markets and the macroeconomy. A complicated problem, maybe that requires a complicated solution. In my view, that's just, I'm very skeptical of that. I think, yes, the problem is complicated, but the fact that we don't have full understanding of it means that in the short term, we shouldn't be worried about thinking about fine-tuned, complicated responses, but rather responses that are simpler and therefore much more transparent. Do you think that the global economy has become too focused on finance? What are the dangers of a finance-centric economy? It's an interesting intellectual question or and practical question about look at the amount of resources that we spend in the aggregate related to um, activities in financial markets and, and 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 is that really how much of that is is um, is is uh, socially productive uh, and, and is that uh, and how much of it is kind of <coughs> uh, potentially wasteful or even even dangerous um, Financial markets play, you know, have played and will continue to play in a very important role in resource allocation, especially in environments with uncertainty. So, absolutely, we have to, we can't, we, we can't kind of uh, give up on the important role of financial markets. Um, exactly, exactly what their profitable role is and which uh, and, and and how that works, I think, remains an inter interesting and open question. Um, so, I. <laughs> I w I'm, I'm not one to say we're in danger of becoming a, a, a too finance-centric um, economy, but I, I think there are interesting questions about what is um, productive roles for uh, financial markets and, and, and how do we kind of design the right government oversight to, to, uh, to, fo to foster that productive activity.